This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. New car sales in the U.S. market for November are in and were down sharply from a year ago and even down from the month before. Ward's Intelligence reports the SAR, or annualized rate of sales, came in at only 12.8 million vehicles. A year ago, it was 15.9 million, and in October, it was 12.9 million. Automakers still managed to sell over a million new vehicles last month, but only three automakers were able to increase sales, Tesla, Mitsubishi, and Ford. Everyone else was down, and in some cases, it was a bloodbath. Audi, Subaru, Jaguar Land Rover, Toyota, and Mercedes all had a miserable month. And while GM does not give out monthly sales, reports from the field say it also had a terrible month. The only bright spot was with electric cars, which were up more than 50% from a year ago and now have 3.3% market share. Tesla's Model Y and 3 led the way, followed by the Ford Mach-E, Nissan Leaf, Hyundai Kona, and Volkswagen ID.4. If automakers can get over this chip shortage, sales will probably explode, and we may be seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. GM boosted its profit outlook thanks to a chip shortage that's starting to ease up, but only a little bit. It says it will make $14 billion on pre-tax profits next year, and that's better than before. Originally, GM thought it would make somewhere between $11.5 and $13.5 billion. Hey, what's up with all these car companies and lunar rovers? Hyundai, GM, Toyota have announced plans to develop one, and now we can add Nissan to the list too. It's working with Japan's Aerospace Agency, or JAXA for short, to help improve the off-road capability of a rover that they're developing. Nissan is leveraging its E-Force all-wheel drive technology, which can control all four wheels independently. It plans to use the knowledge gained from the project to improve the performance of its system in sandy conditions, so there could be some real-world benefits. But it sure is weird to see so many car companies working on lunar rovers. But speaking of Nissan, if you gave its design team the all-electric powertrain from the Aria and said they could build whatever they wanted around it, this is what they would come up with. It's a single-seat race car that sits on a bespoke chassis. Nissan says it took design inspiration from the Aria, but we think it looks more like they tossed one of the original Robo race cars, a Delta Wing Indy car, and Nissan's new Formula E car into a blender. But beyond being a fun project, Nissan's designers said it helped them explore styling for future electric performance cars. Maybach is all about elegant styling, exquisite materials, and off-road driving? Well, that was the vision for two designers when coming up with the Project Maybach concept. Unfortunately, one of those designers, Virgil Abloh, recently passed away from cancer. But what he helped create is a really cool two-door car that we think took inspiration from cars from the 20s, like the tall and upright body, long hood and low slung roof. But with a sense of adventure on their minds, they added big off-road tires, rock rails, and even a cargo carrier with lights. And while a vehicle like this totally bucks the normal trend of what a Maybach is, we bet its customers would snatch up every one it built if it ever did make it. Should car dealers be able to add thousands of dollars to the price of a new car just because inventory is tight? And with online buying becoming so popular, will we even need dealers in the future? That's one of the topics for AutoLine After Hours this afternoon. Are car dealers doomed? We'll have Jennifer Newman, the editor-in-chief of Cars.com, and Pulitzer Prize-winning car critic Dan Neal from the Wall Street Journal on the show. So join John and Gary as they try to figure out where in the world this auto industry is going. Mobility is becoming electric. 
connected and autonomous, just like the manufacturing world. But we'll always be one thing, a reliable partner for our customers. We want to know what drives your testing. OTA, connected car, diagnostics, remote testing, Intrepid Control Systems is here to help you work from anywhere. Intrepid Control Systems, driven by your data. When it comes to autonomous cars, it's kind of two steps forward and one step back. First, the steps forward. Toyota is partnering with autonomous shuttle company May Mobility to offer free autonomous rides in Indiana. The service starts on December 20th in the city of Fishers, which is just outside of Indianapolis, but it will only operate on a three-mile loop. The fleet will consist of five self-driving Lexus RX 450Hs, and they will arrive at one of the nine designated stops every 10 to 15 minutes. Next up is Neuro, which is partnering with 7-Eleven to offer autonomous delivery to customers. The service will operate in Mountain View, California, and will initially use self-driving Priuses. Or is that Pri? Eventually, Neuro will add its small autonomous R2 pods to the fleet. And over in the UK, Ford partnered with DP World London Gateway, which is a port in London, to test autonomous vehicles at large work sites. They conducted the tests over the summer, but didn't actually use self-driving vehicles. Instead, they simulated the process using transit vans made to look like autonomous vehicles that had a concealed driver behind the wheel. The researchers then monitored how workers loaded and accessed the cargo without help from the driver. They found that employees quickly became comfortable with the vans. And okay, here's the step back. San Francisco's public transit operator does not want to give Cruise LLC the last permit it needs to charge for rides in autonomous vehicles. Transit officials say they have safety concerns, and that's because of promotional videos that Cruise has put out that shows riders getting in and out of vehicles in the street instead of at the curb, and that's illegal. It also criticized Cruise for not accommodating people in wheelchairs or offering rides in low-income areas. Cruz said it will respond to the agency's complaints next week. We just had a Jeep Grand Wagoneer roll through the Autoline garage, and if you haven't seen one up close, take our word for it. This SUV is a beast. It's over 18 feet long and has a gross vehicle weight of 7,700 pounds, and you definitely feel like you're in a big old prairie wagon while behind the wheel. And with that much weight to lug around, fuel economy is not great. Only 15 miles to the gallon combined from its 6.4 liter V8 and 8-speed automatic transmission. But it is responsive, quiet, and drives beautifully. It also snowed during our test time with it, and it's so nice to have a 4x4 SUV that handles sloppy roads with no problem. As you guys know, Jeep has been trying to push itself more upscale, and the interior is definitely a reflection of that. The leather seats feature prominent stitching. They're heated in the first two rows, and the front seats also have a massage function. But we do have a few complaints. The dash is pretty cluttered with two touchscreens and all their buttons, and the capacitive controls for the heated seats and steering wheel weren't as responsive as we'd like. But the Grand Wagoneer definitely brings Jeep into a space where it's never operated before. The model we drove has a price tag of just over $109,000. That puts it right smack dab in the middle of other luxury brands like Mercedes, Cadillac, and Land Rover. So what do you think? Is the Jeep brand capable of selling vehicles that cost over hundred grand, Or is that a bridge too far? With that, we wrap up today's show. Thanks for tuning in. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, solutions for your journey. Intrepid Control Systems, over the air engineering, boost your game. And by Scheffler, we pioneer motion.